What's the difference between qualitative and quantitative research? How can we achieve research rigor without testing for statistical significance? What can we learn from Brene Brown about the process of qualitative research? All of this and more on today's episode of The Secret Life of Numbers. Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm LaVanya, your data scientist on call. I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when LaVanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. Okay, let's jump in. This is the start of one of our three-part mini-series this season. It's very exciting, especially because this almost feels a little bit meta, what we're doing the (laughs) mini-series on. (laughs) So why don't you break the suspense and let them know? (laughs) Sure. I think we both thought it would be important to maybe talk about science communication and the numbers of science communication. So that's what the mini-series will be about. This first episode, we're going to talk about qualitative versus quantitative research. The second episode, I believe we're talking about how scientists communicate their research, so through peer review and journal impact factors, those types of numbers. And then finally, we'll talk about what we mean when we say sixth grade reading level. Yeah, and that last part's really important for making sure that research is accessible not only to the public, but to people in different research disciplines, because we all tend to have our own language. The more we work on the podcast, the more I realize that how we communicate the work we do is very important. Yeah, so I guess starting out with qualitative versus quantitative research, we're really putting a stake in what is almost a division in the research community. It's kind of like there's two branch points. People are often quantitative researchers or they're qualitative researchers. And some people crisscross. Yeah, some people use mixed methods. And I kind of view them as different tools. In the work that I do myself, we talk about picking the right tools for the right jobs. And these two different fields of research are really built to handle different types of research questions. And they're also very complementary as well. Mm -hmm. Like one can lead to the other, or you can do both to really get a broader view of what you're studying. So I guess we've done a lot of talking around. We have, but we haven't really defined it yet, have we? (laughs) Some of our listeners are probably like, oh my goodness, could they get to the quotes or the the definitions? Okay. All right. So I'll give some definitions of what this research is. So quantitative research is what I'm most familiar with. Quantitative research deals with data that's numerical or can be converted into numbers. And the basic methods that are used to investigate numerical data, as you know, are statistics or statistical techniques. A lot of the things that you're looking for in quantitative research or when you're looking at quantitative data is you're trying to predict, you're trying to model, you're trying to find cause and effects and correlations. Yeah, and kind of the kingpin of quantitative research ends up being statistical significance. Yes. So are the groups different enough that it is unlikely to be caused by random chance? Yeah, like if you are administered a drug, is there a statistical significance from the control, for example? So that's quantitative research. So qualitative, hit us with the definition. All right, so I am going to be honest with you. I did not know a lot about qualitative research before doing my own research for this episode. (laughs) And I still wouldn't consider myself an expert on it, but I will give you some information that I found. Qualitative research, and this is coming from McGill University because they have a research group in qualitative research, 
And I always like to shout out to a Canadian university. So they say that qualitative research is an umbrella term that refers to a number of research methodologies that are well established in the social sciences. And it's particularly suited for certain types of research questions. For example, questions that address poorly understood topics where there's insufficient knowledge about something that can be measured. How would someone describe their experience or what went into the decision making of do you donate a kidney or not? Or, you know, what's the experience of this group going through bereavement or grief? Another way you could study it would be to make a survey and have people, you know, click boxes of, you know, I strongly agree with this or whatnot. But the making of the survey itself would be an assumption of what that experience is to begin with. Exactly. And in that making of the survey and trying to collect it quantitatively, perhaps, you might miss the point. Because if you're asking somebody to, I don't know, measure their grief on a scale, they're going to have some sort of like conversion in their mind. And your conversion might be different from my conversion. So the the numbers that we select might not mean anything statistically which is what quantitative research is trying to do. And I think that's why it's so important with qualitative and quantitative research and mixed methods, which takes elements of both. Mm -hmm. So you might qualitatively inquire about factors, Mm -hmm. then use that to make a survey, for example, to assess. But it's so important to look at what am I actually studying? Yes. Because that's actually how I accidentally ended up doing (laughs) qualitative research. You accidentally ended up doing qualitative research. It was an accident and I'm I'm still working on the project. But I had an idea for something that I was interested in studying. And I had an opportunity to work with a fantastic group of physicians. And we got together to talk about the project before that meeting, they were like, okay, think about how you'd like to study it and we can chat about it. And then I was like, oh my goodness, this is a qualitative research question. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I guess what we're describing in a sense is qualitative data is verbal reports, observed behaviors, that sort of things where you're not measuring something with an instrument, which is the quantitative approach. Oh, for sure. So for example, like in my project, I'm interviewing people. Yes. And then I'm taking those interviews and transcribing them. And that is my data that I'm looking at. It can also be things like images. You can code those. Something else that's interesting about qualitative and quantitative research is that in quantitative research, you're like always trying to remove bias and you're trying to be like as objective as possible. Mm -hmm. But in qualitative research, they take a much more different approach, if I'm not mistaken. They instead of removing the bias, they just state them and they state how this will affect their analysis. That's exactly it. Because I had to do quite a bit of reading around how do I do qualitative research? Like what counts as rigorous practice? How do I eliminate bias? Especially because some techniques in qualitative research is one person coding the data. Okay. And we all come into it with biases and assumptions. Yes. And a big part of what I found is it's about owning them. And embracing them because they are considered part of the data and the inquiry. And especially if the person coding it who brings those assumptions is also the one asking the questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing if you are trying to understand an experience of a situation, your biases affect the experience. It's part of that inquiry. And I think in some ways that might mean that qualitative research could more closely approximate actual human experience because we remove all those biases in controlled study, which we do need to do to isolate, does this work? But then we take those things out into the real world, and sometimes they don't work like we thought they would. So we've been talking about qualitative and quantitative inquiry kind of loosely, but I found a really nice side-by-side comparison at McGill's website, and I thought it would be cool to like go through. And so like we have like a, I guess, a systematic kind of difference list between these two for our listeners. (laughs) Can you tell we're both more comfortable with numbers and feelings? It's still kind of difficult for me. And I'm actually looking forward to your section because it's still difficult for me to process that inquiry can be rigorous without numbers. What I've had to do is completely shed whatever presumptions I had about research and rigor and quality. Not in the sense that you don't maintain quality and rigor. The goalposts are different in qualitative research. 
you're not going for statistical significance. You're not going to get it. That's not, you're not even asking that question. What you find is just as valuable to our understanding of really, in many cases, it's what does it mean to be human? So this chart, it talks about goals, research questions, data design, data collection, informant selection, analysis, and then finally ends with results. So we'll just give like a brief overview of each kind of section. Yes, just the highlights. We'll spark notes it. For goals in qualitative inquiry, you're trying to build an understanding of a phenomenon. So like a human behavior, a cultural or social organization. And it's focused on meaning. So how do people make sense of their lives and their experiences, as we discussed? Whereas quantitative inquiry is much more reductive in a sense, Mm -hmm. because it's seeking to almost explain cause and effect in like a statistically significant way. If you're looking at a qualitative research question, it's going to be much more exploratory than a quantitative research question because you're trying to understand the experience. So the example that they give here For a qualitative research question, you might ask, how do breast cancer survivors adapt to their post-mastectomy body? But the quantitative side, questions that you would ask there are like, when should women have their first mammogram? The data for qualitative will be comprised of words, behaviors, images, and the goal of the data is to enhance the understanding of the phenomenon. Whereas in quantitative data, by definition, your data will be numeric. So it has to be manipulated numerically. The goal is that it's like precise, objective. You're using instruments that in many cases are calibrated and you can analyze it with statistical procedures. Just totally different approaches, but they answer different questions and have their own kind of wheelhouses. Yeah. And even in this like little description that we're giving, I think you can tell that there are obviously realms in which a qualitative approach will be the better approach and it will lead you to the answer that you want. And a quantitative approach would be, I guess, I don't want to use the word useless, but it would not give you the answer to the question. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I guess the next one is design. And when you're asking the question, it's really the question that dictates the methods. Mm -hmm. So qualitative, it's a lot more exploratory in nature. And researchers don't always know exactly what they're looking for. So the project can actually evolve as you go along. And I'll talk about that a bit more in Brene Brown's research. The approach that she uses is very interesting in the sense that initial data you collect can inform where you look next, because it might raise new questions and new avenues that you want to look at. It can be quite flexible in that sense. Whereas quantitative research, oftentimes the protocol is written out, you'll know exactly what you're going to do before you even collect the data, especially in cases where you have to get ethics approval or you have to register your protocol for a clinical trial, for example. And that's not to say things don't change at all as things come (laughs) up, but there's there's a documented procedure that you are following. All of those things, that elimination of outside biases and what we call making it objective will allow you to conduct those statistical tests. Exactly. The next part is data collection instruments, which comes back to what we talked about, about how in qualitative research, the researcher themselves is actually the instrument. And many of the approaches in qualitative research really embrace the subjectivity of the researcher or kind of owning their own assumptions. In quantitative research, you're measuring things. So you have instruments that you can calibrate, for example, if you're measuring concentrations of an analyte in the blood. You're looking for numbers that you can conduct tests on, statistical tests. Yeah. And so the next one is informant selection, which is really who is your sample or what is your sample in the case of some quantitative projects. So I'm in the throes of recruitment with my project. And it's very interesting because we have very specific groups that were interested in their experiences. And it's, it's not random. You are like purposefully sampling people from the group. And oftentimes qualitative research can be much more personal in some senses. Mm. So it's really whoever belongs to that group that wants to do it. There's also this method called snowball sampling. And this is important for marginalized, stigmatized, or vulnerable groups, especially. 
because what happens is you find a few people who are part of that group. So an example could be women living with HIV on the downtown east side of Vancouver. So you might find a few that are willing to participate in your study, and they might know other people in that group. They lead you to other people. Exactly, that you wouldn't have found otherwise because maybe they wouldn't have been comfortable talking to a researcher had they not known that this person that they know who also went through it had a good experience with the research process. Which is actually almost in contrast to the quantitative side. Because on the quantitative side where we want it to be random, we want the population to be representative of the group as a whole. You want it to like be distributed across ages, distributed across genders. That way you can apply your conclusions out to the general population. Which is very interesting because the sample sizes too that you deal with and qualitative research, sometimes they can be massive, like in the case of Renee Brown's research, very impressive sample size, Mm -hmm. but they can also be quite small. Whereas I feel like a lot of quantitative research can be very limited by sample size, especially if you don't have sufficient power in the study. And that's a whole other conversation and calculation. But in qualitative research, it's kind of different. Maybe those are the only five people in the area with that experience that were willing to talk. So you might have actually captured like 100% of what you could. Mm -hmm the goals of the two types of analysis are very different. Sample size and statistical significance is so key in quantitative research, especially if you're making something that's, like you said, generalizable. And the goal is, it's just very different. I'll take the quantitative analysis because that's that's what I know. But like we've been talking about, when you analyze, you want to come up with things that you can use to deduce things about the general population. So you want to have those precise measurements and use those formulas and get the statistical techniques and analysis, testing your hypothesis, so then you can then apply it out of your random sample. And it's important that your random sample be random because then it's an accurate representation of these people that you are trying to apply the conclusions to. Or at least you hope it is an accurate representation. (laughs) You always hope. Oh, boy. (laughs) And then qualitative research is very different. So oftentimes the researcher builds from the data, like different abstractions and concepts and hypotheses, and it can lead to theories of how phenomena work. So a lot of times it involves like categorizing or um, what they call coding the data. Okay. So for example, you might take from an interview their answer to something or even a phrase or a word or a feeling of the overall sentiment of the question. And you might attribute to it a a code's almost like a tagline, right? So if we go back to the experiences of women post-mastectomy adapting to their new bodies, it could be like, I'm just making something up, but if they're talking about feeling uncomfortable in their new body, that could be its own thing, like uncomfortable in new body. Okay. And then you look at the codes that you have and try to find ways that they relate to one another or conflict with one another. And you work through that to really find what is the unifying theme or message of your findings. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, the unifying like sentiments, I suppose. Yeah, like almost the core tenets. Finally, let's talk about the results. So in quantitative research, your goals are like prediction, generalizability, causality. Going back to that breast cancer example, you're trying to predict what frequency do you need to get tested in order to catch cancer early? Like, should you get a mammogram every year or should it be every two years? Okay, yes. You're trying to predict things. So like another example might be like if you're going to the grocery store, and you buy milk and eggs, with what probability are you going to buy butter? That's important for the supermarket to know because then they can put all of those things together in their organization of the store. You also want to generalize. That's the whole thing with the random sample. So your conclusions can be generalized to the population as a whole. And then you're looking for cause and effects as well on like a statistically significant level. And qualitative research, by contrast, It's more about understanding experiences of, if you've interviewed people, the people you've interviewed Mm. in their own context, right? So you chose to interview them for some reason. They belong to some group or community or have a trait that maybe isn't well understood. So it's really understanding them in their own context. And you're not looking to say, 
this applies to every single person in the planet and we can take this and their experience and their own reality is going to mirror or represent other people's experiences and their own realities that are different. In some ways, it's not as generalizable, but I also think it teaches us a lot about what it means to be human. Not all research needs to be generalizable, I think. Yeah, part of the issue is if it's generalizable to everyone, it almost doesn't apply to anyone anymore. For example, if you're trying to understand the experience of someone with HIV, perhaps the experience of someone in Vancouver would be very different from the experience of someone in like a maritime province. Perhaps they have like different access to resources. So you're, you wouldn't want your conclusions in Vancouver to be generalizable across the country in some senses. Yeah, because that would almost defeat the whole point. Why inquire about specific experiences and understand them if the goal is not to understand them and honor them? Like you could look at T-cell count of people living with HIV across the country and extrapolate things about that of treatment and adherence to treatment and access and all of that. But for experience, that is very qualitative. What is your lived experience? Yes. My thoughts about this, having learned, is that they're just different tools. And like all tools, they have places where they work best and places where they do not. Mm -hmm. And I think that they both have their strengths. And also they have their strengths and they're, they're measured differently. And they're both rigorous, but that rigor is defined differently for the different methods. In data science, we talk about having like your data science toolkit. Like you always start off asking a question that you want to answer. When you know what the question you want to answer is, then you can reach into your toolkit and be like, oh, this one needs a hammer or this one needs a screwdriver. In a broader sense, if we think of science as your toolkit, when you ask the question, maybe you need a qualitative tool compared to a quantitative tool. That is such a good way of putting it. And also leads nicely into what I guess we can almost call a case study of qualitative research. So, Lavanya, do you know who Brene Brown is? Do I know who Brene Brown is? Of course. <laughs> I think I think Trevor Noah said it best when he was like, Brene Brown is like Oprah's therapist and Oprah is like our therapist. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, she's amazing. She is. I think what I find most compelling in her work, because I'm now becoming a bit more of a leader, but she talks about leading with vulnerability. But she also asks you to kind of question your own style as a leader and what do you think it means to be a good leader. So for those of you who might be wondering who we're talking about, <laughs> if you haven't been introduced to the magic that is Brene Brown, she is a research professor at the University of Houston. Before that, she did a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in social work. And one of her main areas of expertise is in shame and shame resilience, and also in vulnerability. Oh, and courage and empathy. I do have a confession to make. Brene Brown is really the only qualitative research that I have ever read. We won't tell <laughs> anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so what I thought would be kind of fun to do as a case study is look at how she does her research. And she talks a bit on her website about the guiding principles of her research and also what counts as rigor in her mm -hmm. arena. And I read her paper on shame resilience theory, which was quite, it was really quite groundbreaking. I think this is like a great example of qualitative research that we may have all heard of. Yes. Now, as we talked about, qualitative research is really this umbrella term. So the specific flavor that she practices is grounded theory. We can talk a little bit about what grounded theory is. On her website, she has a great blog post, I guess, of uh, what the process is and how she does it. But she has this little bit about grounded theory, about the most difficult challenges of becoming a grounded theory researcher that I thought we would maybe read first so that we can feel a little better about our understanding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so number one. The most difficult challenge is acknowledging that it is virtually impossible to understand grounded theory methodology prior to using it. 
That sounds reasonable. I feel like that applies to many different fields of research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The second one is to develop the courage to let the research participants define the research problem. And the last thing that's the hardest is letting go of your own interest and preconceived ideas to, and she quotes, trust the emergence. And that really lends into what grounded theory is. Oh, interesting. This kind of sounds like the process almost reveals the results to you, whereas in a quantitative approach, you kind of go in already with the process defined. It's much more like concrete. But here it sounds like it's much more fluid. Exactly. So the way that she describes it, I think is best. So I'm not even going to paraphrase it because I haven't done grounded theory research. And I think we should let the expert tell us what it is. I agree. (laughs) So from her website, she says, as a doctoral student, The power of statistics and the clean lines of quantitative research appealed to me, but I fell in love with the richness and depth of qualitative research. Storytelling is my DNA, and I couldn't resist the idea of research as story catching. Stories are data with a soul, and no methodology honors that more than grounded theory. The mandate of grounded theory is to develop theories based on people's lived experiences rather than proving or disproving existing theories. Behavioral researcher Fred Kerlinger defines theory as a set of interrelated constructs or concepts, definitions, and propositions that presents a systematic view of phenomena specifying relations among variables with the purpose of explaining and predicting the phenomena. In grounded theory, we don't start with a problem or a hypothesis or a literature review. We start with a topic. We let the participants define the problem or their main concern about the topic. We develop a theory. And then we see how and where it fits in the literature. It sounds like it's grounded in the experience of the participants. That's where you begin. Exactly. And it's grounded in the data. Given what we know about qualitative and quantitative research, and now Brene's approach to qualitative research using grounded theory, I'm really curious to hear about like some of her like main conclusions and some of the research that she's done. I'm so glad you asked because I did a real deep dive into this. I was like, (laughs) what do we know about shame? (laughs) (laughs) So the paper that I read and kind of pulled a lot from is a paper she published in 2006 in Families and Society called Shame Resilience Theory, a Grounded Theory Study on Women and Shame. Okay. I'll just give kind of a broad overview. She, in this paper, really provides the foundation for shame resilience theory. And she interviewed 215 women to understand and determine how and why women experience shame and then see what processes and strategies are women using to develop shame resilience. And, you know, what's the difference between people who are resilient to shame and people who aren't? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So before she goes into this research, does she define shame or does she let her participants tell her what shame means to them? So that's the interesting part of qualitative research is like you could go in with the Merriam-Webster definition, but shame was defined by the participant. Okay. I'll quote directly because I think it's a very apt definition that I don't think I could do any better. (laughs) (laughs) So the definition of shame that emerged from the research is an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. I can get behind that as a definition of shame. (laughs) What was interesting from the research, though, was that participants contrasted shame and guilt very clearly. So guilt was a feeling that results from behaving in a flawed or bad way rather than a flawed or bad self. So guilt is like, I know I did something bad, but I'm not a bad person, and I'm not defined by that. I feel guilty about it, but I am not bad but like shame you like feel it in your bones yeah like you are the problem that's yeah that's the process of shame okay so from that definition there also emerged parts of of resilience people who are resilient to shame so kind of the main components of her theory firstly was that shame is a psycho social and cultural construct so it's it's very multifaceted. It comes down to societal expectations, your own expectations, cultural expectations, media, external influences, internalized ideals, all sorts of things. Okay. 
And then the main concern that participants identified about shame was feeling trapped, powerless, and isolated. A lot of what resulted from women experiencing shame was an attempt to develop shame resilience by decreasing those feelings of being trapped, powerless, and isolated, and then increase the opportunities for empathy and connection, power, and freedom. Okay. Is there a reason why she chose women? So one thing that's interesting is this is just a subset of a larger sample that she interviewed. Okay. So she's interviewed thousands of people about shame. All right. But for this paper, just for this purpose, we're looking at shame in women to have something that's easier to define. Yeah, because I guess like the experience of shame might be different for men and you would want to understand that difference. Exactly. One of the things that I thought was interesting is that so with her shame resilience, it's really the composite of acknowledging your own personal vulnerability. So women who experience shame in an area where they have awareness of their vulnerabilities are more likely to be resilient or like demonstrate a higher shame resilience than women who have areas where they haven't acknowledged that they might be vulnerable in. The next part of it is critical awareness. So the awareness that you have about the social and cultural forces that shape your experiences and your ability to critically assess your personal experiences in the context of those social and cultural forces. The more critically aware you are, the more you're able to avoid individualizing and internalizing an experience as being shameful, and you're able to contextualize it and deconstruct it so that it's not an inherent issue in you being flawed or unworthy of acceptance. Otherwise, you pathologize shame as being something is inherently wrong with me. Like you said, it's like this negative loop of like shame on shame that just keeps building. Yeah, exactly. There's two other components. So the third component is mutually empathic relationships. So there's the continuum of reaching out, and it's your ability to both find and offer empathy. When you're able to develop empathy and connection with other people, it's really important for your shame resilience. So if you reach out for support to others, like if you came to me and said, this happened, I'm flawed. I would be like, well, no. (laughs) And we would go through right? So it's that support and connection, right? That's the antidote to feeling isolated and trapped is feeling understood. Mm -hmm. I have often done, I've often come to you. I'm like, I'm feeling inadequate as a data scientist. (laughs) And I to you. (laughs) So we are each other's mutually empathic relationships. (laughs) I'm glad. We should like put an acronym, mutually empathic. (laughs) Our MERS. MERS. So the last part really kind of ties into what I would say the relationships as well, because it's like speaking shame, and it's really our fluency in the language of shame. If you're able to communicate your feelings about shame, like Mm -hmm. you have to have words and concepts to give meaning to it and to give you strategies to work on it. So you need to know that there's a difference between shame and guilt. Yes. To understand when you're feeling guilty and when you're feeling ashamed. Yeah. So the more that you're able to speak out about it, it helps with everything else, like reaching out to other people, understanding your vulnerability, because what is vulnerability? As we're going through this, I can see how like wholly unprepared a quantitative research technique would be to approach this problem. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's the thing is you never would have gotten this theory from a quantitative approach because they didn't even go in with a definition of shame. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So like you're saying, this is like an example of where the tool fits the research question. Absolutely. It's so interesting because as much as we've talked about how the goal of qualitative research is not to be generalizable, like these are universal human concepts, which is incredible. I understand exactly what you're saying. Like this is very much like almost like a human experience problem that you're trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're not trying to predict anything. You're not trying to look for like causes and effects. Like Bernays Brown's sole hope and goal was to like understand what's happening here. And she did that through interviews and like looking for themes and pulling out themes in those interviews, if I'm understanding her approach correctly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Like, what is the data showing you? You would not have gotten here if you had tried to approach it quantitatively. Exactly. Well, (laughs) we've done a deep dive into qualitative research, and we're getting to the end of the episode, so we won't do a deep dive into quantitative research, because (laughs) to be honest, most of this podcast is quantitative research. That's true. Yeah. (laughs) 
So without further ado, I think it's time to plant our science seed. It is. Each episode, we like to give our listeners something to think about, a science nugget to help you think more critically about the numbers and statistics you hear in your everyday life. So today, we're really going to talk about the scientific method. So we've talked about qualitative research and its methodologies and how the data is collected. But the scientific method is something very grounded, I think, in the quantitative approach. I think there are pieces of it that you see in the qualitative side of things, but I think it's also good to review the scientific method as well. Yeah, let's dive into it. Okay, where do we start? (laughs) So we start with asking a question, like asking a research question, for example. And then you go on to do your background research. That would be a literature review in many cases. And so that's kind of like a difference between the qualitative and quantitative side, because as Brene Brown mentioned in her grounded theory, she didn't start with a literature review. And then from there, you construct a hypothesis, you test it with an experiment, you ask the question, like, is your procedure working? And if no, then you like troubleshoot and you go back, like you cycle back to testing with an experiment. But if yes, you can go on to analyze your data and draw conclusions, and then you test to see if your results align with your hypothesis or if they don't align with your hypothesis. And then if they don't align with your hypothesis, you can like construct a new hypothesis if you want. Like you can go back to the hypothesis stage and test something else if you would like, or you can communicate your results out. Lavanya, now that we have done this episode about qualitative and quantitative research, Mm -hmm. how do you feel now about qualitative research, maybe compared to before? It's certainly less mysterious to me, but it still doesn't feel very concrete to me because like Brene said, I haven't done any of it, but I can I can certainly appreciate its rigor mm. and its approach and see where it is beneficial to approach a problem or a research question qualitatively opposed to quantitatively. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references we use for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. If you like what you hear, make sure to leave us a review or rate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps our podcast reach new listeners. Have an idea of what we should cover next? Want to learn more about what we've been talking about today? Follow us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. Thank mm-hmm. you.